I'm Karim Makani, uh, also a Berkman faculty affiliate, associate, something like that, uh, uh, at the business school at Harvard, uh, and also at the Institute for uh, Quantitative Social Sciences. So, um, so uh, you know, I've got a presentation. Uh, the paper is already up on the site, so you can use that. You can download that paper if you want. Uh, and uh, what I thought is I'll just make this an interactive presentation. So instead of just me presenting for 30 minutes and then making it Q&A, we just open it up as you have questions and so forth. Uh, we can just engage in a dialogue and we'll take the hour, hour, hour and 45 minutes, hour and 15 minutes to be, be through it. Uh, this is joint work with Kevin Boudreau, uh, who is a colleague of mine at the London Business School. Uh, you'll see lots of Boudreau, Lacani, Boudreau et al. papers. Uh, we, we collaborate. We're like a, we're like a duo. Uh, an academia that sticks together and does a lot of work together. So Kevin and I have been um, been uh, working uh, a lot together over the last uh, six years, trying to explore many of these topics that, that we'll, we'll discuss. And our work is situated at the NASA Tournament Lab, which is a, a part of the Institute for Quantitative Social Sciences. Uh, I'll explain a, a bit more about what we do, but essentially we, we take uh, algorithmic computationally intensive challenges for NASA uh, and we get them solved through through crowdsourcing. Uh, at the same time, I'll layer on a field experiment in social sciences uh, as we solve these problems. And so that's that's what, what the driving uh, uh, modus operandi is for us in terms of uh, our, our research approach and so on. Uh, this paper um, has a long genesis, but it really uh, tries to solve a puzzle that we've had for a long time. And uh, so you'll see us. Uh, try to make headway about uh, open versus closed innovation, disclosure, non-disclosure, and these topics because it's it's fundamental to how we organize innovation, and in, in interesting ways has been fundamental to how my research trajectory has also uh, progressed. So um, I've been thinking about crowds and how crowds can be uh, utilized for innovation for about 17 years. Uh, when I first encountered open source software communities while I was working at General Electric a long time ago. Uh, and that became a, has, begun, has begun a long journey to sort of think about how crowds have been used in the economy. And what we see out there are two, um, two fundamental ways to, to set up crowds. One is through uh, competitions uh, and contests. So essentially you uh, set up an institution where lots of people are competing to solve the same problem. They're working in secrecy and at the end you award a prize. And here I've sort of spent a bunch of time trying to understand you know, who wins and why, uh, how we sort of think about how big a contest you want, uh, sort of how people have an essential taste for competition and that impacts performance, uh, motives in contests, why people participate, uh, and also a range of questions about behavior in contests. Um, at the same time, um, uh, we've done a, a, there's a bunch of research also on communities, so the open source software world. Um, and there, I've done a bunch of work looking at, again, motives to participate, uh, the costs and benefits of participation, how self-selection matters in these communities, uh, and how you can actually uh, find partners to collaborate with, both online and face-to-face. -face. Um, and in many ways, these two worlds have been separated for me in, in the sense of we did a whole bunch of studies diving deep into the organization of contests and a whole bunch of studies looking at collaboration. And this paper actually is going to try to do both, trying to assemble, uh, look, look after both these things and see what differences are and what the similarities are. Um, you know, I, I was, uh, it was interesting, when I started my research career, I, I looked a lot in communities and collaboration. And of course, open source is the only best way to organize software development. Uh, but then I was very surprised to see platforms create competitions and contests. And it didn't make sense to me that how, why this was working so well and also why this was also working so well. And so a lot of my work uh, now is trying to really get the boundary conditions between these two institutions. Uh, and this paper is sort of, uh, is headed in that direction. Um, as I discussed, uh, you know, we work a lot with NASA. Um, uh, the platform we use quite a bit for our software uh, uh, contest is Top Coder. Uh, about 600,000 members worldwide. You know, they have run over 15,000 contests, creating a whole bunch of software for a whole bunch of organizations. Um, 
And then uh, most recently, I've been working also with colleagues at the medical school where the question of collaboration actually is, is very important for them. And we've done a range of field experiments with them to see how uh, uh, scientists and physicians can collaborate together. Uh, uh, because in many ways, the institution for collaboration is very much like open source in the sense that uh, uh, people self-select their partners. People choose their projects, choose their partners, instead of in a company where it's very much top-down. Um, so this setting has also helped us to also think a lot about collaboration as well. Um, just to give you a flavor of what kind of work we do, I'm just going to show you a quick video of a challenge we ran last, uh, actually about a year ago, uh, for, for NASA. So you'll get a sense of the kinds of contests we run uh, and then the types of research we do after that as well. Energy, in one form or another, powers everything on Earth, and the man-made things floating above it, too. This is the International Space Station. You've probably heard of it. It's powered by the sun, and the sun's energy is captured by the station's solar panels. Ensuring the space station harvests the most energy possible is a complicated task. Why? Well, for one reason, see those large solar panels? Holding them to the station are very long, thin arms called longerons. Anytime an odd number of longerons are in full sunlight, with others in the shadows cast by the rest of the space station, they bend, and eventually break. For this reason, ISS operators are careful to position the station to limit shadowing, and so only an even number of longerons are shadowed at one time. However, this conservative positioning reduces the power the station can collect from the sun, thus causing inefficiency. NASA wants more power for the ISS. More power means more science and cool stuff that NASA can do on orbit. NASA needs a sophisticated algorithm and they think you just might be the key to this whole equation. Introducing the NASA Tournament Labs International Space Station Longeron Challenge. Your solutions just may help power the International Space Station and allow more science from more scientists around the world. Consider this your invitation to blast off with NASA. For more information, visit topcoder.com slash ISS, if you've got the right stuff. So this was a two week long contest, 30K prize money altogether. Um, you know, we had pretty broad engagement. So uh, 2,000 people signed up. Uh, we had uh, 459 people submit. Uh, programs basically for us to evaluate uh, and then you know uh, the winners you know Italian Chinese Chinese Polish Chinese Chinese uh, Eastern European Canadian Chinese Eastern European as well <laughs> forget the countries uh, so you know broad engagement uh, and also actually uh, pretty high performance so what I'm showing you right now is the final output uh, from the algorithms for solar power uh, for the space station uh, and this is sort of the, the, the distribution of the submissions, and what you would, would want to care about is the counterfactual, like how good is the internal NASA solution uh, that we compare this to, uh, and it's uh, better. Uh, depend, depending on how you measure it, you know, we were basically able to uh, achieve, you know, surpass or come close to what NASA has internally, which they developed through their own private contractors. Um, and what's interesting also is that it's not just one or two solutions, it's like lots of people actually met this. And this was, you know, lots of years, lots of investments in creating the solution, and we were able to replicate and exceed what NASA has within two weeks. Uh, so this basically sort of, for us, uh, you know, as, as, as social scientists sort of thinking about how these systems work, we want to actually always have a counterfactual. So we can show you all this great performance, but then you want to have a counterfactual to sort of say, how well does it work against what already exists? And you know, this is part of the work that we're doing in terms of amassing lots of examples in a whole range of circumstances where we can see these systems outperform what happens within uh, traditional settings. So what is this paper about? Um, so the paper that I'm trying to walk you through is that, uh, 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 that when we think about innovation and institutions for innovation, there are two major goals that any institution for innovation has. One is creating incentives to exert effort. Uh, and the second is to disclose knowledge. Uh, so once you find these great solutions, you want them to be able to disclose that knowledge to other people so they may build on top of this. Um, and it's the timing and form of the disclosure, we argue, is what differentiates systems. So if you think about 
open science versus open source. In open science, in the scientific process, we disclose our knowledge after we get rights to publish and our name attached to something. Versus in open source, there's a lot of intermediate back and forth going on between the various programmers uh, that, uh, you know, as the solution is being developed. So this timing is actually what, 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 what makes the difference between open science and open source. Uh, and um, uh, the argument we make is that uh, intermediate disclosures, as in what we see in open source, dampens incentives and participation yet leads to high performance. And we're trying to understand that, that result as we walk through the, the analysis. But this is what we find in our, in our, in our analysis. Uh, and uh, there's more exploration and more experimentation in regime of no uh, disclosure. Uh, um, and what we see is that the convergence of technical paths on, on, on really high performing solutions is what drives the ability of intermediate disclosures regimes to do better. Uh, and this conditional, of course, on having the appropriate knowledge stocks. So this is the overall plan of what I'm going to try to get to um, in our discussions and provide you with evidence from uh, a contest and experiment that we ran to get at this. Uh, but that's, this is the, the main point. And so, um, you know, I think this room uh, and I think uh, the, the, the view often always is that disclosure is always good and open disclosure and immediate disclosure is always good. And we're, we've come in and said, yes, but it's conditional on a bunch of things. And that's what we'll try to, try to get, um, get, get underneath it. Okay, um, so, so, so let me just give you the highlight in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the dual objectives that we sort of find uh, in innovation systems. So you first want to offer incentives of some kind or the other for people to, to exert effort. Uh, and we have various different ways in which uh, the different systems that exist in society offer these incentives. So uh, patents allow for monopoly rights uh, for, for firms or for individuals. Academia, it's all about funding, right? You get funding, you get promotion, you get awards, you get honor. There's an incentive system behind academia that's driving participation. In open source, we see use benefits, people need the code themselves, reputation, intrinsic motives, all of these incentives are at play. Um, and in terms of disclosure, uh, what we see is that patents, in fact, are a disclosure mechanism. They make private knowledge public. The trade-off society makes is that, you know, in order for you to get the monopoly, you must disclose the, the knowledge that you have. Uh, academia, you know, of course, we all are under publish or perish rules. Uh, and, and open source is actually enshrined in the process, both from a legal perspective of GPL, but even just how things work. Disclosure is part and parcel of the process that we sort of see these things. And I think it's important for you to just know that that's, that's the basic makeup of, 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 I think, most innovation systems, incentives and disclosure with a, with a view towards reuse. Um, and what we argue is that, uh, at least in, in the literature that I know about in, in management, there's a false debate between open and closed. Like people say, oh, this is open innovation, this is closed innovation, evil, but good, blah, blah, blah. What we're saying in the paper is that, in fact, it's all about disclosure, when the disclosure hammer comes down and who decides what is disclosed and when. Uh, and that's the differentiating components between this debate of open versus closed. There's a lot of other, uh, other baggage that we can attach to it, but fundamentally the differentiator is, is when disclosure happens and then who has the rights to use those disclosures after the fact. Uh, so, you know, so in a whole range of institutions, disclosure is what happens, right? So patents, you have a complete in, in invention. In academia, you have a published paper. In a prize contest, you actually have a technology at the end developed. These are all attempts at disclosure. Um, at the same time, um, what we see is that intermediate disclosure uh, in, involves a range of outputs, including, including complete outputs, but a range of intermediate out outputs as well. And certainly, you know, uh, the Human Genome Project is a great example of a system which actually enshrined intermediate disclosure as part and parcel of the academic system. First time it was ever done. Has never been replicated again in, in academic sciences, and we'll talk a bit about that near the end. 
Uh, but the Human Genome Project basically said that as soon as you made the discoveries, within 24 hours, you're going to release them to the open web and to everybody else in the academic world for reuse. Uh, open source, right? Both from code fragments, advice, and tips uh, to having completed code. All of those elements are intermediately, in, intermediately disclosed within the within the system. Um, and there's now uh, in academia also biological repositories in which you can share organisms and mice and that kind of stuff to get a certain set of uh, of, 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 of objects, scientific objects that can be used for further research. So both of these uh, uh, institutions exist. Can you say a little bit more about what you mean by disclosure? So patent law has very strict standards for whether, you know, a paper at a conference counts as disclosure. Yeah. Um, and it strikes me that there's some intermediate room here. Absolutely, yeah. So, yeah, so we're, I think if you sort of think about it, what we what we argue is that there's a completion element to it. So you complete the invention or you, you have a published paper, right, before you allow anybody in the world to participate in, in using it. Versus here, there is this, this incompletion. Like it's not useful yet. There's lots of <laughs> stuff in between that could be used, that could be put to use for future developments. But we're we're still disclosing that throughout the invention process. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Although I'm still wondering about like the mathematicians at a conference who work on a question together, or yeah, th those are those are those are newer in. institutions that have come together, right? So, the, okay. so that 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 would that would, that would be put in under the intermediate disclosure bucket. If you're at a, at a conference and you present a paper, right, and that paper atta is atta your name is attached to it, then that's that that would be put in the bucket of final disclosure instead of intermediate disclosure. Well, right. I think uh, this may be what you're getting at, but in the patent system, disclosure happens in different contexts. Yes. So I thought you were talking about disqualifying disclosure that might, uh, you know, be outside the grace period. In Europe, there is no grace period. Yes. Uh, so that serves one purpose. Then there's the 18-month publication, which is kind of a, a preliminary disclosure. Yes. And then there's the final issuance of the patent. Yes. And of course, one strategy that patent applic applicants use is not to disclose as much as would make it practical to follow on innovators, just disclose what's legally sufficient. Yes, yes. Yeah, so, so there's all these games that people play in the patent system. We're not gonna, I think we're gonna look at a more abstract level of completed invention, right, versus intermediate work towards an invention at the end. And, and the sharing of knowledge in between those two. Uh, so, uh, What's interesting is that intermediate disclosure is actually, you know, historically important. So a, a bunch of work by Allen uh, and Meyer is now showing, and Nuvolari has been showing that a range of industrial uh, revolution inventions were actually done in communities where people were constantly sharing knowledge about how to improve upon technologies that were essential to it. So Allen sort of talked about this from a, from a from the height of a blast furnace reach. Uh, and Wire has shown this in terms of uh, the development of the airplane. Uh, and uh, his work is actually pretty seminal because Meyer is showing that there was a very much an open source type of community that existed that shared knowledge about how to get flight and sustain flight. Uh, the Wright brothers were part of this community and then uh, they would achieve flight and then they, they basically went right to patents, patent the heck out of it. Um, and then the community basically moves to, your, to Europe. And so if you sort of think about the, the terms that we use now for mo modern aircraft, fuselage, early on, and so forth, those are all French terms because it was basically in France that the community reestablished itself and exchanged knowledge. And the U.S. government had to intervene and basically, you know, stop the Wright brothers from exerting too much control because they were basically preventing innovations from coming through. Uh, and so, uh, and so, so we see that intermediate disclosure as you know both a modern perspective from open source, but also from historical perspective as well. Um, what we know from uh, sort of you know uh, decades of research on incentive systems uh, is that there is uh, an innovation is that there's a, there's a trade off between incentives and reuse, uh, um, and the issue is sort of. How do you balance ex ante incentives? How do I encourage David to keep investing in innovation uh, while also making sure that, that his inventions are, are widely available for others to, to, to reuse? Um, 
the, the basic economic argument is that greater emphasis on disclosure requirements will lower incentives for, for an inventor because you can't reap the fruits of your invention by yourself. Other people could, could, could potentially come in and, and grab it. So that's what economists of innovation have, 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 have spent a lot of time thinking through. And there's great work by Scotchmore and her colleagues, Jim Besson, uh, and so on, uh, that sort of tr tries to untangle this, 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 this conundrum. Uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and uh, Scotchmore's book, uh, Incentives for Innovation, is actually a, a landmark book because it's, it, she walks through all the different economic arguments for various types of, of incentives that we need uh, for innovation and the various institutions that exist and the trade-offs between those institutions. Um, and what we, what we see is that in order to get overcome this, in, this incentives versus reuse trade-off, society and our innovation systems have created compensating mechanisms to allow for some degree of incentives, even in a world of disclosure. So in academia, we disclose our final products, but we are playing a, grand, a game of priority and citations. Right? And that's what drives us to keep letting people know about our discoveries. Uh, in open source, it's about signing and authorship, right? Your, your, your name is attached to that piece of code. And that's why you may actually participate. And so this, these systems exist to basically uh, uh, to allow for this trade-off to exist and to then create some mechanisms, compensating mechanisms, so that we can have workable innovation systems uh, in our society. Um, and we may also attract individuals like David who may have you know, non-traditional motivations and a sharing ethos, right? So there's heterogeneity in the population, right? The puzzle for me when I started looking at open source uh, versus contest was that they were both equally good, but the people there were very different. You know, there's a set of people that love sharing, a set of people were like, I wanna be number one, I don't care about sharing, I just want the rewards. And they could be equally skilled. Uh, and that's what, that's what we'll get at in terms of how the society itself is bifurcated in these, in these different uh, preferences for these regimes. Um, and of course, and we know, right, incentives matter, right? So this is Bill Gates, uh, you, know, uh, you know, more than 40 years ago, uh, sort of arguing for, uh, for incentives, right? So, you know, he says, you know, will quality software be written for the hacker market? Most of you steal their software. What hacker can put three man years into programming, finding all bugs, document his product, and distribute for free? Most likely the thing to do is theft. Um, and then nothing would please me more than being able to hire 10 programmers and they'll use the market with good software, right? This is what established Microsoft and billions of dollars of revenue uh, and profits were accrued by having this, this story about incentives in place, right? On the other hand, we have Linus, there's Torvalds, right, who says, hey, you know, do you pine for the nice days of Minix 1.1 when men were men and wrote their own device drivers? You know, are you without a nice project to decide to cut your teeth on an OS you can try to monitor your needs? I'm doing a free operating system, won't be big and professional. Uh, you know, <laughs> I've enjoyed, this is, this is great, right? This is like early, early days of the internet. I've enjoyed doing it. Somebody might enjoy looking at it and even modifying it for their own needs. Drop me a line if you're willing to let me use your code, right? And arguably, this has had as much of an impact, if not more, than what Microsoft has on, on the world as well, right? But two very different views about what motivates innovators and what motivates uh, our innovation systems. Okay. And and so that's that's this is like so from a you know from an academic point of view, it's, it's kind of like very you know abstract and very interesting, but it's very practical as well. Right? These debates happen in our society today, and we make rules and choices based on these debates as well. Uh, one one thing that you should you should know and agree upon is that the more open something is, the more access there is. You'll see increased reuse. So there's a bunch of papers already out there that show that in fact, as you open up the the the, the dial, as you turn the dial towards more reuse, more sharing, you'll get more reuse and more sharing to be expected. Uh, and so of course, the work of uh, Eric von Heppel, my advisor at MIT, and and colleagues have shown that user innovation, the phenomenon that's so important in the economy, is based on the fact that people can easily reuse and build on the work of others. Um, uh, we, we've seen platforms emerge as the ways to reuse of common components, right? And the platformification of the world 
is based on the fact that we can, the platform owner can create components that can be rapidly reused for, for new inventions. Um, and academic science, uh, you know, is again based on this thing that future citation rates are a function of reuse rights. Some great work by Fiona Murray and Scott Stern uh, uh, and other colleagues have shown that in fact, you know, as you, as you turn the dial of, of towards more reuse rights, more reuse in fact occurs. Um, so this is the, the, the traditional argument, right? There's a debate between incentives and reuse, and that's what matters. But there's a separate view about innovation, which sort of almost brackets the innovation incentives argument and says, let's solve solving process. Like, in the end, innovation is about somebody sitting in front of a computer or in front of a machine tool and trying to invent something. And that is a problem solving process which requires search. So if you cast innovation as a search process, then different uh, arguments can be made. Uh, uh, so so if, if the first argument in the literature is about levels of effort and knowledge reuse, uh, search can be thought through as you're just basically, you're basically trying to find a solution to an uncertain uh, uh, search space. You don't know what high value solution is going to be, so you need to be searching. Uh, uh, and what innovators try to do is they try to use novel combinations of existing knowledge to come up with their valuable solutions. And if you take this search paradigm to heart, uh, what matters is as much as there is incentives and reuse, you also care about the direction and paths of the search, uh, of the teams of folks that are searching out there looking for solutions. So this, this points to let's also focus in on how this, the, the, the artifacts are being created and the mechanisms by which innovators are actually engaging in trying to find their solutions. Um, and there, there's again a, a ton of literature that takes this perspective that actually innovation happens on trajectories and paths. Paths get set up and then people fall down these paths and these paths are consequential. And so when you take this view into account, new sets of hypotheses can be raised about, again, how do we think about disclosure uh, uh, in light of search. So uh, what we have seen in the literature is that uh, there's some very formal mathematical conceptualizations of search. Uh, Simon has shown this quite a bit. Uh, uh, and uh, what we know is that uh, one stream of literature says that multiple independent search tra trajectories are important for innovation outcomes. So you actually want lots of people searching independently. Uh, you don't want just everybody converging on the one solution. And the, the, the broader the search trajectory, the better off you are in terms of, uh, of innovation outcomes. Uh, but there's a tendency for the community of searchers to converge, to pick the early good paths and go in that, in that, in that direction. So we have a tension. We have a tension between broad searches being important for innovation outcomes, but a tendency for convergence amongst innovators. And this, again, you can now start thinking about in terms of disclosure. If you allow for disclosure or no, no disclosure, you may have these approaches or these approaches coming at you. And the concern that the literature has had has been, you know, do you get trapped in a local optima? Do you converge quickly on a local optima and stay there versus broad search, multiple search directories coming through and you finding the best, uh, best outcome? So I'm going to skip to these predictions because they're, they're like, you know, they're garbed in academic language. So we'll, we'll, go, we'll go through that and we'll just get right into the, what we did to un untangle this, this kind of stuff. Um, so what we did is we said, let's just implement a field experiment where we take a real problem and try to, to solve it and see if, in fact, we can, we can recreate these conditions. Uh, you know, it's very hard for us to, in fact, compare across open source and open science. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so what we did is we used the top coder pl platform and we offered cash prizes and we created a contest to enable us to bring in these, these as, as policy treatments that, were, that people were subject to, in to when they were trying to solve this problem. Uh, and what we did is we worked with our medical school colleagues uh, to actually uh, create a solution to a, a, a genomics problem, a competition biology problem. Uh, and the, uh, our ability to use this platform over this problem allowed us to get very fine-grained 
details about the performance of the solutions, the technical paths used, uh, you know, individual characteristics of the, of the solvers, and so on, to get really good at identification of what's really going on within these within these, within these settings. So uh, the problem I'll skip through this is, is basically around immunogenomics, and uh, it's a core functional problem in uh, in uh, in, in in genomics of of, of, of sequence alignments. Uh, and the challenge was anti hundred thousand sequences on a laptop. Um, and um, here's what we did. We announced this contest on the platform. Uh, we had 700 people sign up to, to solve the problem. Uh, and what we did is we then matched them on skills, uh, and then we random, randomized them into three different treatments. Uh, the first treatment uh, was one of, and I'll, I should walk you through the final disclosure treatment. So what we did is we said, in the final disclosure treatment, there's two weeks, $1,000 prizes at, each, at the end of each week. Right? And you're just going to be working in a contest format, right? You're just competing, and there's a prize at the end of the first week, and there's a prize at the, at the second week, and we'll reward the top five. In the interview disclosure, we basically established a, a wiki-like setting, right? So as soon as you submitted your code for analysis, that code uh, and scoring, that code was available to everybody else. They could take it and reuse it. Uh, and that was the setup in the interview disclosure setup. One week the same way, the second week the same way. And then we also created a mixed regime where the first week you were working in darkness, so you were competing in a contest. And the second week, you were actually set up uh, to, uh, to uh, go after in, the, in a wiki like setting where all the knowledge was available for reuse by the people. Was it three weeks at the end of LOL? Yes. And people were isolated. Did you, okay. So yeah. Said, did you worry? Yeah, about we, worked, we, we worked pretty hard to isolate these folks completely, yeah. How is it you were giving? A prize in the middle of a competition. Um, is this the kind of work where half half of the work could be evaluated, yes. the other half being there? Exactly. No, yeah. So basically, they were solving a problem, and then we were scoring it against a test suite. So as soon as they submitted the code, we could look at how good how good they were towards that that solution. So there's an objective, automated testing suite that tells you how good you are. So after the first week, they may only be you know, passing fifty fifty five percent of the test. Exactly, they get a score. They exactly. Keep working on it until they get close to 100. Yeah, exactly. Do, do they have a test suite available? They have a they have a they have a sample test suite locally, but then we have we have reserved a whole bunch of other tests yeah. test cases in the back end. Absolutely. Do they know their relative rank compared to other contestants? Yes, yes. So so the top coder, in fact, and I'll show you the details. So they know. So they would know they're both their their skill rating themselves as a compared to everybody else, but also. Uh, as, as soon as the, they, they submitted their code for testing, and you could submit it any time during the week, and you will, as you'll see, there's multiple submissions. Uh, as soon as you submit, you get assessed and given a score, then you can see how well you're doing against somebody else as well. Okay. Yeah. You keep submitting over and over again. Yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we exploit that. Um, so this is the prize distribution. Uh, so, so if you sort of think about our operationalization, right, we have a disclosure regime where the mechanism for disclosing is a click on the solution catalog. You can, you can actually look at the rankings and ratings of people and say, whose code do I want to look at? And we're tracking who's doing that. Uh, uh, and then we also had an incentive for disclosing. So you submit your score for testing, and then half the money that's awarded goes to citation. So people, if they use other people's code, had to cite them. So we built in a bit of that system. Uh, and then you, you, you could get money for if your code was being cited highly. The non-disclosure re regime, you cannot observe the solutions, all communications are barred, uh, and will be held constant is the problem, the assignments, the interface, the market signals, the total first, and the top five prizes. Okay, so, so, our, if you, so if you think about what we're doing, if you think about it from a, running a medical trial, right, we have a group of people that were giving a treatment of disclosure, and a group of people that have a non-disclosure treatment, and then we see how that works, and some that are mixed. Okay, uh, so again, like what I showed you in the NASA problem, this actually results in pretty incredible performance overall. Okay, so again, we had the 733 signups, 120 coders submitted, 654 submissions. Um, not only do we get lots of people submitting, we also get a diversity of approaches. So we have 89 different approaches to solve the same problem, and I'll walk you through how we determine that. Uh, winners from Russia, France, Egypt, Belgium, and the US. 
Um, and you know, you can annotate a quarter billion sequences on a, on David's laptop, basically, with this code um, in an hour. This is what was, again, shocking to me and what shows us why, as a general thing, we want to be thinking more about uh, using crowds with our, with our, uh, with our uh, innovation efforts. Uh, so this shows you this, the final submissions uh, uh, broken down into, into two components. One is speed, how fast can you solve the problem? And this is uh, in log time, okay? Um, and secondly, how accurate are you in being able to solve this problem? And point eight is a theoretical maximum for the data set we had. The green dots represent the final submissions from our guys. The red dot represents the NIH Gold Standard Solution Megabast, okay? Lots of investments over lots of years. The yellow dot represents uh, one of our colleagues' code. He was a, he's a physician and a researcher at the medical school and the, the effort spent by his lab to create the solution. And then this is all our friends, right? Top left is where you want to be. Uh, so we're, we're basically, again, able to show some incredible performance gains by going to the crowd, regardless of the institution we're actually using, and we'll, we'll, we'll decommal that in a second. Uh, but this in itself is kind of shocking. Uh, and I think what it's telling me is that across our economy, there's a whole bunch of lots of low performing solutions that exist that can be actually be improved upon radically. Uh, and in the world of big data and lots of data and NSA and all that kind of stuff, right, we, we probably need to be able to speed up many of these algorithms and make them much, much better. Um, so, so, so this works. This works, you know, both from a practical point of view and also from an academic point of view. So who signed up? So we had, again, 700 people sign up uh, from 69 different countries. Uh, top coder has a skills rating, I'll show you in a second, uh, which allows us to sort of show the distribution of skills that people had. 44% uh, of them were, were professionals, 56% uh, students, uh, you know, uh, the undergrads or graduate students, uh, and, you know, mostly a, a young person game in terms of who's, who's showing up and participating. Uh, what's great about Top Coder is that it allows us to uh, control for skill. So one of the concerns you should have about anything where you have a crowd going is that it could just simply be a skill effect. The, the highly skilled people show up, and then that's what's driving the, the, the results. Uh, and Top Coder has an objective rating of skills based on your, your past performance against everybody else. And so that allows us to put that in the regressions as a control. Ma'am, you had a question. Graphics that you just showed yeah. in the previous. Uh, do you have any information about women or men participating? It's mostly guys. It's like 98 percent, 99 percent guys. Uh, we just don't see that many women on the computational side of the platform, uh, and it's consistent with uh, some of economic research showing that, uh, and some of my own research that women uh, choose not to participate in in a contest type setting, per se. Uh, there's many reasons for it, but uh, we, this is all most of us. Okay. Uh, and I knew the answer ahead of time. Good, good. Uh, of course, you care about why, why do people participate in these contests, right? Like, what, what, what motivates people to participate? Um, and um, what we find, and this is actually across, again, both communities, both communities and contests, we find extrinsic motives matter, so cash. Job market signals, community prestige, those things matter to people. Uh, we also find intrinsic, the fun, enjoyment, learning, autonomy, those elements matter. Um, and we also find that pro-social, community belonging, uh, and, and identity also uh, drive participation. Uh, what's clear uh, from open source settings is that uh, these motives are heterogeneous, uh, and that different people, uh, for different people, different things light up. Um, and now in our work on Top Coder, we're seeing the same thing, that uh, in, in, in contests as well, that people have very heterogeneous motivations. Importantly, because we have the skill rating, uh, in some future work we're gonna show that in fact there's no correlation between skills and motives, uh, that in fact they're orthogonal. Uh, so you could be highly skilled and care about this, or you could be highly skilled and care about that, which has deep implications for again how we organize our, our innovation systems. And remember that in contests, most people are losing, right? So there has to be other things driving them besides, besides just money. Okay, so let's let's get to what's going on. So what do we see? The first big message is that there's lower participation 
and intermediate disclosure, okay? Fewer people participate when they're given the treatment that all your code is gonna be available to everybody else, right? So this is the traditional economic argument. When incentives are lower, fewer people are gonna draw, uh, fewer, fewer people are gonna participate. So both in terms of the number of active participants at any given point in time, but also the cumulative number of entrants uh, uh, across the contest as well, all right? Uh, and what you also see is that uh, the hours worked also by skill appears to be lower uh, in, uh, in both uh, 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 for the intermediate regime as compared to uh, the, uh, the other regime. There's some, there's some convergence here, but when you account for it all, these are statistically different, significant differences across the board. So people, fewer people enter, those that enter in the intermediate regime also work fewer hours. Okay, uh, and you know we could basically see that uh, in our in our results, uh, both from an hours work perspective, uh, submissions perspective, and participation rate. So given the number of the pool of people that are available, how many were participating, so we sort of see that 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 these numbers are lower in the in intermediate disclosure regime. Okay. Again, this was contrary to my expectation. My expectation was, again, if, you're, if it's open, you can get somebody else's code and then reuse it, right? That's, how awesome is that? But the incentive argument comes in and kicks in in, in a big way. Uh, and this is what we sort of see. Are there rules uh, that relinquish all claims, legal claims for the code when you submit? Bo both, had, submit. both had at the end that everything was gonna be open sourced and made available to, to Harvard. Yeah, it was the same. So for the intermediate regime, I mean, is there an incentive to just wait till the last minute Great and question. benefit, look at what everyone else does, and then so they can't benefit from Only yours? one person did that at the end, and he apologized profusely for doing it. He was just <laughs> testing us, testing our credibility <laughs> and doing that. So only one person did that. Because, again, this is the community setting where everybody knows everybody. So if Jocko is going to come in and do that, like, I mean, he got a lot of gruff from everybody else saying, hey, you know, this is not the intention, right? But, but he showed that this could be done. Did it work for him? Yeah, he, 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 got the, he got the top prize in the second week. Oh. Because that was a rule. That was a rule. We suck at rules. But then he got shamed in the forums. Oh. So he got like 500 bucks, uh, but lots of shame. <laughs> Human nature, <laughs> you know, kicks in. Uh, now, what we see, though, is that there's better performance, right? We see better performance in the regime. So both in terms of, so we're controlling, you know, by, we're, we're allowing for skill level differences, and what you see is that you know early days there's some, you know, so, uh, so not that much difference, but then over time, in Indonesia it just shoots ahead in the first week, and then in the second week it's just it's just up, you know, completely out of the. Is that scoring up. speed or accuracy or both? This is a combination, yeah, a combination. Okay. So the average score is basically when you account. Um, for skill and effort is about 1.6 points higher uh, for for the intermediate disclosure regime, uh, which basically makes a difference between winning and losing uh, in the end across the board. Okay, um, and of course, as you would expect, the vast majority of people are peaking, right? So what you see here is that in the mixed regime, nobody's peaking, and then boom, everybody participates. And then here, between the two weeks, lots of people are are peeking out of people's code. Right? Once it's available, you're gonna look at it and do things with it. Peek means I can open up your code and look at what you're doing. Oh, yeah, 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 no, sorry, that's, yeah, exactly, yeah. So, of course, the question you have is what, what explains these results? Um, so, what we did, right, is we said, okay, so we have the intermediate versus incentives story, uh, but is there something else going on? So. We went through and we went through every single code submission to actually discern uh, solution paths. Uh, so uh, we assessed, how we're working with a, um, Paul Rouleau, who's now doing his postdoc at the School of Public Health, he went through a, a whole bunch of submissions and said there's 10 canonical approaches being used in all these submissions. We took those 10 canonical approaches and then we had three other people, uh, PhDs uh, from Germany and from China, go through every single code submission and tag them for these canonical approaches. Uh, and here are the different types of approaches, Hamming, Hash, Lemonshine, you know, a whole bunch of different things. There are basically things to uh, 
you know, the two sides, right? Get faster and then also get more accurate. So that's what these were all at. And what you can think of them as their solutions are combinations of the techniques, right? So there's 10 different techniques and you, you, you get to see which one of those techniques are they implemented uh, in, the, in the code base. So I'm glad I didn't do it. I, you know, we hired people to do it. So this was, this was grueling to go through every single submission and look at what they'd done, understand it, and then from there, uh, help us select them. Um, and what we do sign, what we do find is that um, uh, uh, combinations are actually consequential, okay? Paths are consequential because we can now discern different paths being used by different competitors. And what we see is that there is a, a direct correlation between the number of paths used and performance. Okay, so as you implement more paths, as you implement more techniques, you know you get uh, you get you get better solutions, and that there's a difference between the various different paths uh, uh, achieved. Um, and this is our search argument, right? What you can see when you're comparing no disclosures versus disclosures is. You see this up and down crazy search patterns used by people when they're working blindly. Versus what you see here in the intermediate disclosure regime is this nice smooth boom where at the top we're performing away. And this is what is actually important for us. So there's a contrib one contribution for us is to be actually be able to show you these pathways are, are materially different. And what we discovered is that, uh, that, the, uh, that the regime uh, of intermediate disclosures used 30% fewer novel techniques and novel combinations okay? uh, as compared to the no intermediate disclosure regime. Uh, and so we looked at the Harpendahl index of submissions across approaches, and we, we see these, these metrics coming through. So there's just a much more bunching across a fewer submission paths than what happens in the in the in the known initial disclosure regime. Uh, and what we see is that the final disclosure folks, people without intermediate disclosures, are searching broadly, but they're searching on the lower tail of the performance distribution. Okay, so they're just out there looking at, at, at worse solutions and trying to figure them out. Versus these guys at the top end do much better. So let me just walk you through the summary of results, and then we'll have some more time for uh, 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 conversation. So when we think about incentives versus, versus reuse, um, we see that in energy disclosure, fewer part participants, uh, they exert less effort, yet, the higher, yet there's higher marginal and average performance. Uh, vast majority of people will peak and, and reuse solutions. Uh, and the search behavior is such that there's more exploration and experimentation in the in final disclosure, in the closed regime, uh, and convergence and coordination over the best paths in intermediate disclosure. Okay. So uh, what this means for us is that uh, you know, we confirm this view that increased reuse comes at the cost of incentives. All right? uh, uh, the overall stock of knowledge being created is lower right, from pure quantity point of view. Right? The quality is higher, but it's lower. Um, and we see this convergence and coordination of behavior in the, in the, in the intermediate disclosure regime. Uh, and it relies on this stock being of high quality. Uh, and the potential concern that you would have in any kind of a system that implements open disclosure, intermediate disclosure, is that are you going to get stuck on a local optima? Are people going to basically find themselves in a local optima and improve upon that instead of searching broadly. Um, and so path dependence, we think, is a risk is a risk in open systems. Now, if you sort of think about Linux, Linux already had a map from Unix that it could basically rebuild on. Uh, and so there was actually no worries about op lower, lower, lower quality paths being discovered because we already had the paths there. And a good way to sort of think about this graphically is to sort of uh, have this view of a solution landscape where you might have a global optima and once you guys find it you can go, go right up it but if it's in a more complex neighborhood you know there there could be risk of somebody being stuck up here somebody being stuck up here in an open set setting versus in a much more uh, uh, independent search you may be able to reduce 
actually uncover the entire landscape. Um, and so there are, you know, comparative advantages of the different systems. Um, uh, in intermediate disclosure, uh, you know, where you have a broad stock of knowledge already, we can reuse it and make it better. Uh, and potentially the diversity of participation uh, may overcome uh, local optimal lock-in. Uh, and there may be compensating incentives, like we discussed, uh, and benefits to participate. In final disclosure, uh, it's useful where broad-based search is needed, where you want lots of people working independently towards a problem. Uh, you know, you may emphasize implicit in incentives as well, you know, in terms of fame, reputation. Um, and, um, you know, of course, I, uh, I'm at Harvard Business School, I must give you a two-by-two, two, you know? <laughs> That's like in our contract with the dean. Uh, this is like a, a quarter by, you know, I don't know, this is, this is a missing quadrant. So anyway, <laughs> so what you can think about is, in the economy, uh, we can think about people having a view about incentives versus reuse trade-off. Some institutions emphasize disclosures, some emphasize property rights and exclusion. At the same time, you would think about, do you disclose the final inventions or intermediate, intermediate uh, uh, inventions? So our industrial innovation system patents and markets is based on final disclosure, right, and property rights. Open academic science, public invention contests are about uh, uh, final invention disclosure with uh, uh, final inventions but emphasis on disclosures, and human genome project, open source, open data is all about intermediate disclosures. So we can start to think about various ways in which our systems or innovation fit in, and then think about, is that the most optimal way, given the problem we're trying to solve for? Um, and I always made this argument that, you know, even firms, you know, actually use a lot of open intermediate disclosure type regimes. So if you think of Apple as a bastion of closeness, and Steve Jobs as the, as the guy who controlled everything, but you know, they're the biggest, uh, one of the biggest participants in open source software communities. And you know, your iPhones all have tons of open source code uh, that, that utilizes that. So firms have figured out ways to play both sides and know when to participate in one regime versus the other regimes. I think we have to catch up as academia to sort of understand the, the, the costs and benefits of those and how that works together. Okay, so questions, thoughts? Thanks. Yes. So, just to clarify, did the uh, intermediate solutions yes. or, or immediate disclosure, did those get just better average solution or was the best overall solution? Best also came from there as well. Yeah. How much of a difference was there between the best solution and the final disclosure category? Uh, and the other two? the final, I believe the final one was, I think, uh, in, the, in the complete rank order, it was like sixth or seventh. The top. No surprise, the top ones were all open disclosure because they all had the same base from, to work from, and they made slight tweaks to get one, two, three, four, five. So, so like the disincentives of participation were trumped by the higher quality. No, but through. remember, there were there were still disincentives to participate because not that many people participated. So, from the pool of people participating, there's just fewer people participating, but they just happened to lock onto a good solution, <laughs> and they could all then collectively get get there. Okay. Very quickly. You. You divided three groups, but you really only talked about two of them. How about the one in the middle where, where there was intermediate disclosure halfway through? Yeah, so mixed, the, the paper has details about that, uh, where we, we basically uh, find the same effects. So the in, in the close time, there's lots of lots of entry, lots of exploration, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, lots of effort. Uh, then in the in the open time. You know, lots of people drop out, but then they take the best of what what exists, and then they they rank it up. So mixed actually came. So the rank ordering was, uh, you know, uh, op disclosure, uh, full disclosure, then uh, mixed, and then uh, then uh, then no disclosure. So, you, there, you didn't appear to be any advantage to deliberately having that. Uh, Mixed no, I mean, I think, no, no, not in this problem, right? So, I mean, I think what we need is like 100 of these problems being yeah. run in these two ways for us to be able to get that. This is just, a, it's hard for us to run them sure. repeatedly, and so it's just a petri dish for us to be able to see that. Yes. Uh, you mentioned earlier that there were two types of people, um, ones that really responded to competition and others that didn't. Yes. How did you control for that? 
So and in this case, we did not. So in our other research, we actually have been able to elicit preferences as to people's tendencies to uh, prefer to work in a cooperative regime, which is a co competitive regime. And we see that in, uh, in other analysis that that's actually consequential. Here, we basically assume that the people, you know, they, all, they, they, that, that they, they couldn't select their, their preference. They were just given that treatment. And based on that, you, you would allow for it. But I think th that, for me, explains why we see such heterogeneity between uh, contests and competition and collaborations, and also how firms organize themselves as well, right? Some firms are very much team-based and lots of collaboration. Other, peop other firms are very much like individual effort matters, and that's what we pay you for. Uh, and I think we see in the economy, some people gravitate towards the collaborative systems, and some people gravitate towards the competitive systems. David. Uh, the, these contest platforms are very specific and they're artificial in the sense that they have artificially constructed um, incentives of various sources as well as some natural intrinsic ones. Can you talk a bit about your... So I wouldn't, I wouldn't call them artificially constructed. I mean, you know, they offer incentives. The, 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 okay. Um, like they offer a salary. You know, like... <coughs> so they're a system of incentives yes. that are peculiar to that site. Sure, sure. You don't get automatically out in the real world always. How confident are you that the results that you're seeing in those environments apply to things like open source, especially given the very troubling 98% male? Yes. Uh, you know. Yeah, so I mean, open source is also close to 98% male. <laughs> so so there isn't that can much we, difference. Can we pretend otherwise? Uh, we can't. <laughs> Wikipedia, <laughs> you know, again, same thing. Uh, so I mean, so, I, mean I, th I think the, the question of generalization is actually a very good question. Right? So can we take this, this semi-natural lab and does it generalize to a whole bunch of other settings? Um, I, I, my, of course, my answer is yes, because <laughs> uh, I'm an academic and everything generalizes. But the reality is, is, is that even this platform is selecting on a very elite set of people that are used to competing, right? And are used to, uh, so one, one, one criticism of this work would be, well, look, you know, you have attracted a bunch of people that are competitors, and all of a sudden you're making them disclose, like share. They're not used to sharing, so that's why people aren't participating as much. That could be a, a genuine criticism of our work, and I accept that. That's just a limitation of, of what we can do. Although I do think that uh, rank order based outcomes, right, devoid of the contest platform, are are endemic throughout society, right? So you look at SAT testing, you look at law school testing, you know, you look at uh, league tables for law schools, you look at league tables for business schools, you look at, you know, so, so CEO level contests, right? So rank ordering is endemic in our society. It's used in a variety of settings. Uh, and, um, and so in that sense, I think we could, we could argue that there is generalizability here. Uh, and even if you sort of think about, even in Wikipedia and open source, there is an implicit rank ordering going on. There is, there are status battles going on, and there's status-based ranking. In fact, Wikipedia thrives on giving you status, more or less status, right? The whole bureaucracy is set up to give you more or less status and creates a rank ordering uh, based on that. So I don't know if that answers your question, but a reasonable answer. Building on David's question, I'm curious how you would comment on the the relationship between the findings of the study and the effort to generalize or abstract to a system in which the outputs of innovation are not units of code or, yeah. you know, I don't know, a, a, a sort of tangible output, but if they're, you know, education systems or ways that municipal governments operate yeah. or some larger level thing. Yeah, so I, by, 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 um, just to get analytical tra tractability, I've always studied coders because I yeah. can look at their objects, I can I can evaluate them, and so on. Uh, one good news is that you know, as Andreessen is saying, software is eating the world. So more and more of the world is becoming like like software programmers, which is great. So we can test. You know, it's great for social scientists. Um, um, I, I do think that there is, you know, devoid of the of this of this ability to to look at these fine grain measures. I think there is sort of generalizability here in terms of the way work is organized and the way you would organize innovation. So even in a municipal setting or even in a government setting, people have to search for a solution, right? People have to engage in some kind of a problem-solving effort, even though the outcome may not be a tangible piece of code. 
And that's where we think our, our contribution is that if you think from a search process, then these, then these findings apply. How broadly you're searching, which is how narrow you are, what are your inputs that go into your search process, I think then these, these findings can. Yes? Quality and skills of the coders. You, yes. you seem to think that you could you could manage to uh, scale them or, or, or recognize that they all had similar uh, skills. No, uh, so not, not similar skills. But or similar abilities. No, because no, couldn't so you what we had is expect a, that, that that was another factor, that you had one group that was particularly better skilled than another? I think that's a good question. Let me just show you where's my graphic. Um, So the, the, the top coder regime is built on creating ratings for all the participants, skill-based rating based on a specific type of a task. So what they, what they well, you can't see it that clearly on this, on this projector, but you know, they have an algorithm task, they have a development task, they have you know, uh, architecture tasks and so forth. And as you participate in more and more contests, uh, you, know, you get a skill rating compared to other people. And they actually create a whole distribution, like where are you in the distribution of skills uh, for people? So what we did in our analysis is to take that skill rating and put that as a control. So that's a okay. control in our, in our regressions. So we account for the skill of people, and then we see if there's a, there's a treatment effect from our, from, our, from our treatments. Because that was, the other part of my question was related to more of a cultural or scientific or, or educational basis. Yes. Because you, you identified a large group of Indians, Russians, yes, uh, Americans, yes. etc. And we know if we look at the PISA scores <laughs> that the results of the educational systems and the studies that are done are, are quite different. But maybe this is a particularly a particular group that, that yeah, so, I mean, doesn't you know, follow into that. Yeah, so I mean, these are weird group. people in the sense <laughs> of you know, half a million people that like to compete, like to have a public disclosure of their skill rating. You know, so they're special. And like menu. coding. And they like coding, exactly, exactly. So they're, they are special in those, in those ways, for sure. How many hours are they working on? Uh, this one, on average, we had about 20 hours. Weeks. Two weeks, or two weeks. So 10 hours a week. Yeah. yeah. Which is about similar to what people spend on open source. Right. I'm interested in the guy who... Um, Cheated basically, waited to the last minute. No, he didn't cheat. He, he, cheated. <laughs> he, he, he violated the, the, he, he violated the, the spirit. norms. Right. But those, I mean, he wouldn't, in real life, he wouldn't have had to apologize. He would have just won. Yeah. So, how does that translate to. So, so no, but so what we have, right, in, in both, uh, in many, so you know, the work again of Eric von Hippel, there's some very nice new, a new paper by Nick Franke at, uh, at uh, University of uh, Vienna looking at cheating in crowds. Right, so Eric Van Hippel's work has shown that there are informal norms-based mechanisms to control cheaters, right? So he looks at French chefs, right? And the fact that you don't see that much rampant recipe copying amongst French chefs. There's no copyright in recipes, right? You can take, you know, Dave's famous souffle and then, you know, and then call it your own, right? Uh, and, but, but in fact, there isn't that. So there's norms-based rules that communities develop. And Nick's work, actually, what he did, which was, which was brilliant, he took, um, I don't know how they got it past the IRB, but they went on Threadless, and they would take somebody else's design and then, then resubmit it, right? Complete copy, resubmit it. And what they found is that the crowd is like, there's these expectations of fairness and honesty and participation that comes through, which, which in fact prevents this from happening rampantly and controls it. Even in business school, yes, even in business schools. So, so we, ha we, we in fact, inform we create these norms about fairness, which the, for which there's no explicit regulation. So, so I think what happens in society is that communities form, you have reputations, right? And people will, those reputations and those norms matter and people behave within those norms. Yes. So right now in Congress, there's re proposed reforms of both the patent system and the copyright system, yeah. and especially with copyright, there is a um, a call to having more database approaches on uh, what actually encourages innovation and incentive and <laughs> so forth. So, um, if Congress called you down mm. and and asked you um, to testify um, about your research and and its implications for the patent and copyright system, uh, how would you respond? 
I'm glad they're not calling me. Uh, uh, this reminds me of one of my, you know, field exam questions <laughs> when I was doing my doctorate. Um, I, I mean, of course, you, you would give the academic answer, it depends. Uh, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I am, I mean, I think, I, I, we know, in, you know, if you, if you sort of, um, uh, so there's a great artist on YouTube called Kudiman. Who takes, uh, who creates these amazing videos of uh, people playing different instruments, and then he just grabs the different instruments and creates compositions from it. I mean, there are beautiful, comp both lyrics, sound. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, so, and but imagine kind of trying to get that through. So, I think he has like in each song there might be like 50 or 80 people that he has spliced together, um, uh, and they're works of art. They they truly are, um, and um, you want, and we know that our culture works on, on sort of creative recombination of existing materials. Like you need a stock of knowledge to recombine, and I think I think it's a question of balancing the creativity that can that can come from from these approaches versus strict strict limitations that 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 dampen that dampen the, the the reuse. So I don't actually have a good answer for you. I mean, I think we need we need. I, I think if there's a view, you know, my law friends would say that the Congress has gone too far in protecting incentives and not enough for encouraging creative reuse, right? So patent terms are too long. Copyright is life plus 70 years, like, like you know, something, something crazy like that, which is, which, is, which is, I think, probably too far. So there's probably some way for us to, to dial that back. Certainly, given our culture now of access and reuse and recombination, the tools for recombination have exploded. And so we probably don't want to, we don't want to limit that, but we still want to create incentives for original works. Uh, Brian may have some perspectives on this, uh, but, uh, but I, I certainly, I tend to shy away from very specific policy debates and look at my p-values instead. Do you have a, uh, yeah. Well, this is, yeah, this is a, Private ordering situation, yeah. which is very interesting. So you can't extrapolate from this the public policy or default open situations very easily. But it does suggest that, at least in this context, the importance of cumulative yes. innovation. Yeah, and now what I would argue though is, I mean, what's interesting is, you know, part of the motivation was that, like, why wasn't the Human Genome Project Bermuda Rules broadly adopted in academia? It's a big puzzle, right? Because you know you had NIH and uh, and the Wellcome Trust and a whole lot of other public public says if you want funding from us, you will disclose your discoveries right away within 24 hours because we had a race against Celera in many ways, and and many people point to the Bermuda Rules as being as a tipping point towards the public effort succeeding so wildly and so greatly, and now we're living in the fruits of that of that of that of that ordering based on that on that on those regulations. That has not been replicated. That has not been embraced in acad academia. Like we call ourselves open science, but we're not really open science. Uh, we don't have a lot of sharing have, because our incentives aren't set up that way. So if there's a role, right, let's, I mean, I think patent systems and copyrights are very difficult because the interests are so entrenched. But certainly in academia, we own the purse strings. We decide the rules. And there should be potentially conversations about, you know, and there's, there's, there's at least open access debates now on the final portion, but could we think about other ways to go after that? I mean, certainly the, I don't know what the details are for the, for the brain project that Obama is funding, uh, but that could be an interesting place again to remember. Isn't that sort of, you know, once you know how to do it, isn't that just basically number crunching? No, 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 discovering, dis no, 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 the, 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 the discoveries were not just number crunching, there were actual, actual work being done because people would then reserve those discoveries for papers. Right? I found this correlation with this disease or this, this mechanism for this, this particular phenotype. I can write a paper about that. that. That's what they basically gave up on in terms of being, being, uh, keeping that private uh, until the paper got published. Well, this, uh, you know, I'm, this is not an area I'm expert in, but it sounds like this goes to the, the recent Supreme Court decision that said that genomic fragments were not patentable. Much later, much later. 
right? But 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 I can still publish a paper on it as an academic. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But you're creating a new kind of value in publishing the paper that that's making right. the correlation. That, that's right. But 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 that's what that, that that prior to that, people would not even publish the the correlation. They would wait till the paper was done and then make that available. So I'm actually really curious about your use of the Human Genome Project as an example. Yes. Um, it was obviously an unprecedented collaboration across academic institutions. Yes. But that's also kind of precisely what enabled Craig Venter to splinter off, start a private company with most of the work done, and then profit. So how would you, yeah, I'm definitely seeing why openness and collaboration is good, but how would you prevent people from taking publicly funded innovation and turning it into private profit in that way. Yeah, I mean, I think that's all about contracts, right? It's about the contracts you write and what, what, how you, how you actually control for defection, right? So we have this in Linux right now. We have this in open source, right? Where there's the BSD world, which is like, we want you to share, but if you want to privatize it, you can. And GPL says, no. In fact, we care about you sharing everything, and you can, you can, you know, you can sell it. But you still need to make the, the code available. So, and or look what Apple does, right? Your iPhone, our iPhones have a tons of things, and so they've made a bargain saying, you know, we want this code in here, and we'll contribute back to the communities, but we can wrap it up in ways in which uh, creates greater value. And certainly, I mean, I think you know. So you know, I've always argued about this. You know, I don't want my mom. My mom uses TiVo, right? Has lots of open. I don't want my mom on the Linux kernel mailing list, right? She should not be participating on that. Like she'll just add a lot of noise, all right. She shouldn't be sending Linus and Nora saying, you know, the, this box isn't working that well, right? So, so there's a there's value to what TiVo did with using Linux or what other what, what Red Hat did with Linux, wrap it up in ways in which it was broadly accessible, but the they also contribute back to the public good as well. So I mean, I think that's the you want a trade off that says there is a public good contribution even though you can privatize some components and resell that components. But I think it's about the contracts. That should be, I'm afraid, our last question. Great. Thanks very much. It was great. I was just keynote. Oh, sorry. I saw oh, it. Was. It's the third keynote I've seen today. I've never heard of it. It's <laughs> um, really well. Yeah. Please get some blogging stuff.